Hello friends, in this video let's see how we can optimize the direct vehicle job not only to make it easy to perform but also give excellent post-operative visual outcomes. And let me steer you through every step of the procedure. Now this patient is being operated upon under topical anesthesia ensure that you've got a good fixation whichever technique works in your hands. After making the side port incision I inject a small amount of intracameral lidocaine say 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 cc I found that intracameral lidocaine has a lot of beneficial effects even if the patient is blocked because it tends to keep the pupils dilated and also anesthetizes the iris the anterior chamber is then filled up not entirely but enough with 2% hydroxypropyl methylcellulose in this case, I'm creating the Wong's pocket first and then the main corneal incision underneath that. Now, this Wong pocket will help me to close the clear corneal incision if I encounter any problems. So, this is a pre-placed Wong's pocket incision or stromal hydration incision. Ensure that you have a very good visibility. You have a well-formed anterior chamber. There is no positive pressure and then the speculum is not too tight on the eye before you start with the capsular excess. I like to start the capsular excess at 9 o'clock position and finish the subincisional area first by creating a C tear. Now this will enable me to finish the capsular excess without folds of the anterior capsule slipping out of the clear corneal incision. Before performing hydro dissection, always depress and let out some visco and then Take the beveled cannula underneath the capsular excess edge, tent up the capsular excess and then inject small aliquots of fluid. Even though you saw the nucleus rising and sometimes even a fluid wave always ensure nucleus rotation before proceeding. Fill up the chamber with 2% HBMC and then you can now get up with the direct phaco chop technique. So, you can use for the direct FACO chop either the pulse mode or the multiburst mode of FACO. Set the power according to the grade of the nucleus sclerosis. Impale the FACO tip just above the midpoint of the nucleus. Make sure that the angle of attack is steep, that is more than 45 degrees. Ensure that the FACO tip passes to at least 50% of the depth of the central nucleus core. And then you use a sharp tip chopper and impale the nucleus just proximal to the phaco tip, create the crack and then separate by embedding the phaco tip into one part of the nucleus and then using the other hand with the chopper to create the separation. Do not move both the instruments or both hands to make the separation. Impale, hold with the phaco tip and use only your left hand to make the separation. This gives you a greater level of control. It also enables you to go deeper into the crack in order to affect the separation. Create not just four fragments, create at least six fragments even for the grade two nucleus sclerotic cataract. The reason is the pieces that are mobilized are small. What I do is I mobilize only one small fragment at a time. I bring it into the central zone, emulsify this ensure that the entire fragment is completely emulsified and there are no small bits left behind. Before I attack the next fragment, the anterior chamber is extremely clean and free of any free-floating lens fragments. This ensures that you don't have sharp fragments compacting against the corneal endothelium which could be one of the major causes for endothelial damage during phaco emulsification given the strong flow of the aspiration flow rate. So one piece at a time, bring it to the central zone, emulsify it, make sure the anterior chamber is extremely clean and free of nuclear fragments before attacking the fragments. And in this way, keeping the phaco probe in the center, not chasing after the pieces with intermittent application of phaco energy and phaco power, able to remove all the nuclear fragments. Once this is done, ensure that the corneal epithelium is kept moist by coating it with, and once again, HBMC. 
The cortical aspiration is then performed. You can use a bimanual IA or a coaxial IA. That is totally up to you, whichever you are feeling comfortable with. Once again, the technique that you do most often is the technique that you are comfortable with. So in this case, I washed off all the cortical material with the coaxial IA probe, which I feel very comfortable with. The next step is the implantation of the intraocular lens. Load the intraocular lens by yourself. Even though it takes a little more time, you are 100% sure that you do not create a mix-up. Inject the lens slowly. Remember the IOL shoot is a phenomenon that is produced purely by the surgeon. The IOL is an inert object. It will not shoot by itself. The only way it shoots is if you give too much of power or if you are too precipitate. So be very very gentle and very very careful in injecting the IOL so that you don't have a sudden gush of the intraocular lens which will create damage to the capsular bag. So once the IOL has been injected, evacuate all the viscoelastic from within the capsular bag and also within the anterior chamber. Retained viscoelastics can not only produce post-operative inflammatory response, they can also cause the intraocular pressure to spike up in the post-operative period. Finally, ensure that you've got a good seal of the clear corneal wound. This can be achieved with stromal hydration and as you noticed that in the beginning of the case, I created a Wong's pocket. It's a good idea to do so. I do it quite often these days. So just inject little fluid in the Wong pocket to create what is called the sandwich hydration and that's it. You can be 100% sure that this wound will seal. You see how well the anterior chamber seals and formed. It becomes deep and the pupil dilates indicating that the anterior chamber is now safe and secure. At the end of the procedure, I inject a little bit of moxifloxacin and that concludes the procedure. Thank you for your attention.